Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Sapelli, you recognize for five minutes. Chairman Murphy and Ra Ranking Member Deget, uh, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this important hearing and for your leadership in addressing the crisis of addiction to opioids in this country. My name is Marv Seppel. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation. I attended Mayo Medical School and have been practicing in the addiction field for 27 years. Uh, on a personal note, I've also been in long-term recovery uh, from addiction since age 19. Uh, the Hazel and Betty Ford Foundation is the nation's largest nonprofit addiction treatment provider, and we've been around since 1949. We have 16 sites in nine states. We offer prevention and recovery solutions nationwide for youth and adults. At our facilities, we've seen a pronounced increase in the number of patients with opioid use disorders, paralleling the grim stories you've probably been hearing about in your districts for some time now. At our residential youth facility, for example, opioid dependence rates increased from 15 percent of patients in 2011 to 42 percent in 2014. That's a dramatic rise, and this is an especially difficult addiction to treat. Individuals dependent on prescription pain medications and heroin often face unique challenges that can undermine their ability to stay in treatment and ultimately achieve long-term recovery. They're hypersensitive to pain and more vulnerable to stress. Their anxiety, depression, and intense craving for these drugs can continue for months, even years, after getting free from opioid use. They experience a strong desire to feel normal again, to escape what seems like a permanent state of dysphoria, which puts them at high risk for relapse. They're also at higher risk of accidental overdose during relapse because they no longer have the tolerance to handle the same doses they were taking prior to treatment. In other words, with opioids, unlike other drugs, relapse often means death. In 2012, we launched a new protocol to treat opioid addiction, the Comprehensive Opioid Response with 12 Steps, or CORE 12 as we call it. Our approach is grounded in the traditional 12-step facilitation model and based on abstinence, but it now also use, utilizes the safest life-saving medications to keep patients engaged in recovery long enough to achieve lasting sobriety. We, not, we don't see a conflict in utilizing medications and pursuing abstinence. Uh, just as Bob described, even when medications are part of our protocol, abstinence is still the objective. In fact, one might call it a third way because it strikes a reasonable common sense balance between those who see medication assistance and abstinence as diametrically opposed. Our CORE 12 program includes changes to traditional group therapy, additional patient education about opioids, and the, the option now of medication assistance. We utilize extended release naltrexone, Vivitrol, as well as buprenorphine, naloxone, or Suboxone to help engage patients long enough to complete treatment and to become established in solid 12-step recovery. The highest risk period for relapse is the first 12 to 18 months after treatment, so we prefer to have our patients uh, involved in on-medication, um, in outpatient care throughout this extended period, and our goal is to discontinue medication as our patients become established in long-term recovery. While our clinicians recommend which medication is appropriate, the final decision is up to the patient. And about a third of our CORE 12 patients elect to use no medication. Uh, indeed, medication only addresses the biologic aspect of addiction. Our broader measures treat the psychological, social, and spiritual components to improve psychosocial functioning, enrich relationships, and foster a healthier lifestyle. And those are the keys to recovery that lasts. Our CORE 12 program has resulted in more patients completing residential treatment and a reduction in overdose deaths after treatment. While the research study of CORE 12 is ongoing and we do not have full results yet, we do know that CORE 12 patients stay in treatment longer. Our atypical discharge rate, those who leave treatment early, for our general population is 13.5 percent. And for those with opioid dependence who don't enter this program, it's over 22 percent. However, in this program, it's only 7.5 percent. Uh, based on our early positive results, we plan to continue paving the way for others to use both scientific and spiritual solutions to engage more people in treatment save lives and ultimately help more people get into long-term recovery. <clears throat> I'd also like to emphasize the need to educate our wider culture about the dangers of opioid overprescribing. The troubling trends began to emerge in late 90s after the FDA approved OxyContin and allowed it to be promoted to primary care physicians for treatment of common aches and pains. Education campaigns often funded by opioid manufacturers minimized risks especially the risk of addiction and exaggerated benefits to using these opioids long-term for common problems. When prescribing on a short-term basis to treat moderate to severe acute pain, opioids can be helpful, but when these are highly addictive medications are taken around the clock for weeks, months, and years, they may actually produce more harm than healing. 
An increasing body of research suggests that for many chronic pain patients, opioids are neither safe nor effective. Over time, patients often develop tolerance, leading them to require higher and higher doses, which ultimately can lead to quality of life issues and functional decline. It should be noted that doctors didn't start over prescribing out of malicious intent, but rather out of a desire to relieve pain more compassionately. Uh, we have a culture that seeks opioid medication for pain relief and not just for physical pain, but also to numb psychic pain. Some of these patients have a significant risk for the development of addiction in a culture that promotes quick fixes, instant gratification, and escapism. Medical professionals need further education about the proper use of opioid medications and their risks. The pu general public also needs such education to improve recognition of risk and limitations of these powerful, dangerous medications. It's time now to address opioid overprescribing and overuse without stigmatizing pain. This crisis deserves the attention you're providing today and requires a substantial response. Thanks again for having me here for your leadership. Uh, I look forward to answering your question. Here, uh, Dr. Cipella. Um, a federal policy prohibits uh, Medicaid matching funds being used at inpatient facilities of more than 16 beds whose patient roster is more than 51 percent people with severe mental illness and for individuals between ages 22 and 64. Does this affect inpatient substance use disorders clinics as well when they have those limitations? It sure would, absolutely. Uh, any population that's restricted in that manner uh, is not going to get adequate treatment. So again, making sure we have options available, that's, that's an, a barrier that we need to eliminate. Increasing options for addiction treatment is really necessary in this country. Uh, we don't have adequate treatment to address this problem, but we also have a public health information problem because if you look at the uh, data from SAMHSA, you'll see that over 95% of the people with addiction don't even know they have it. So that's where the initial problem lies. And then of that small group that seeks treatment, the biggest problem is access. But another concern we've heard is from states that there's limitations on they have funds for substance abuse and they have funds for mental illness, and oftentimes they can't use those together. Anybody want to comment on that, um, of what we should be doing to make sure that they have maximum flexibility in the states? Can anybody comment on that? Yeah, Dr. Cipella? In our residential settings, uh, in our youth settings, so it's about age 14 to 24, over 95 percent of our population enters treatment with a coexisting diagnosis of a mental illness. Hmm. In our adult populations, again, a residential, not an outpatient setting, it's over 75 percent. So, so what we're seeing is uh, comorbid psychiatric illness with addiction in our treatment settings. It, it's the norm. We have to treat both. Thank you. And so in your opinion, anybody else can weigh in on this too, would increased coverage of MATS help more individuals to remain in, in recovery? Can yes, too. We've had to increase our own infrastructure, just to have enough people involved to get these uh, medications approved. You're talking about people who spend time on the phone and... Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. Trying to limit our doctor's involvement and have other people do that, usually nurses, but it, but it really has required adding FTEs to what we do, so increasing our expenses just to get these medications approved by insurance company. And eventually you do get them approved usually? Usu I would say usually is a good description, not always. Yeah. Yes, yes, Dr. Spell, I'm sorry. I do support both of your recommendations, Congressman. We should have over-the-counter uh, naloxone. It, it's a very innocuous drug. You know that. I mean, there's not much in the way of side effects or problems you can cause with it. It does one thing. It blocks opioid receptors in a very safe manner. And, and as far as the prescription drug monitoring programs, when they're not mandatory, as was described earlier, only about 33 percent of docs use it. So there's not adequate information on them. Uh, we need it to be mandatory and across state lines. And to our other panelists, are there ways that research can be connected into positive treatment outcomes? Absolutely. It should be one of the focuses of most research to look at positive treatment outcomes and actually negative treatment outcomes to define both for the rest of the field so we know what we're doing and, and we can individualize care in a much better way. Right now, there is not research that shows who should be on buprenorphine versus who should be on Vivitrol. Can't, it's not been defined. Our field is limited in regard to the type of research to make those decisions. We need a great deal more research in this field. Is there anything that's been planted as a seed that needs to be grown to a bigger program of research, or is it just being avoided in general? I think research dollars are so limited across medicine right now that it's really hard to get. Well, there's a theme around here at times to cut research, which I oppose. I think it's the wrong path. but. 
Our, our, we have a huge system. We're in 16 states, and, and we don't even have the infrastructure to gain grants from uh, NIH. We can't do that. We have to partner with people to get research dollars. The research we're doing on this program I described is self-funded. Uh, we can't get the money we need to do the research in our setting. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe Dr. Sapala would like to address that question as well, if that's okay. Thank you. Would, uh, we've had a couple of leaders of the drug court system come and look at our program, and, and they've held a fairly conservative stance in regard to the use of Suboxone and other maintenance medications for opioid dependence over time, but I think they're shifting. So I believe that you could play a huge role in pushing them along in this direction. They, they need to go there. So uh, let me start with uh, Dr. Sapala. M my question to you is, are opiates being overprescribed? And, and I want to get to the why, if that is the case. Yes, they are being overprescribed, um, and they're being used for purposes that they're not necessarily proven to be effective for, in particular when it comes to chronic pain. Our opioids are the best, most powerful painkillers on the planet. They're necessary for the practice of medicine and for relief of suffering. Um, but primarily in an acute pain situation. Uh, chronic pain studies are not long-term and don't show over the long-term effective relief of chronic pain. Opioids just don't work that well, and yet they're being prescribed readily for that, so people are taking them for months and years. Uh, so is there a standard of care as to when it is appropriate to prescribe opiates for the management of pain? This. There are standards of care defined for the prescription of opioids for pain, for acute pain, and for chronic pain, and the, there's been a shift in how that's viewed, and the standards have shifted over the last 10 years, first to increase the prescribing of opioids for chronic pain, and now to decrease and go back to a more conservative approach. So it is being understood in the medicine, but but... Uh, you know, I'm reading the literature right out of the pain folks who understand this, and primary care docs don't necessarily follow suit for years. They start mm. to kind of catch up. So we do need to educate our physician population. <clears throat> I'm writing down some of your recommendations. I have a number of things here. <clears throat> Change the 42 CFR program to bring us up to 2015 standards of integrating physical and behavioral medicine so that we can know who is getting addiction treatments and, and, and help that with the practices. Improve the intra and interstate communication between pharmacies and physicians so uh, they can distinguish between patients who truly need a medication versus those who are involved with addiction uh, shopping. Uh, <clears throat> better define recovery. Dr. DuPont, you had said not in terms of just today, if they're off medication, but recovery is a longer term, and many of you have used the word chronic, and we need to be paying attention to longer term data. We need more education. Uh, to monitor uh, physicians uh, and mo more education monitoring for physicians so they understand prescription drug uh, uh, use here and what treatment for pain is. Uh, we also have to make sure we do have insurance parity to truly deal with this treatment, something we've been dealing with in this committee for six or seven years now. We need more providers who are trained and experienced with mental illness, severe mental illness, and addiction. Um, more inpatient beds for treatment for detox, for in-depth treatments that meets the needs of the patients, and understanding that medication-assisted therapy and psychosocial therapy are not enough. We have to make sure that we have the spectrum, the palette of treatments available to people to meet their needs. I think now as we look at that sobering number of 43,000 overdose deaths and a million and a half people on some of these medication-assisted treatments, uh, we have our marching orders. This is not something that's simple, but it's something that uh, I think is doable.